What's good, Trey? Shitty ass, Trey. Trey, I unblocked you too. Damn, this dude got 97. Three ball. Send me a pick, sport. Pop right. Alright. We need that two point. That's a bad pass. Good shot. Mr. Mate, good shot. Damn. Mm. Okay. Go back to the big. The teamwork. Yeah. Ah, bro, we not getting on no twos for this in this game right here. I mean, I played the twos, but boy, them twos is terrible. Good defense. Light pressure. No comment. Sport. And they won't let you push through that. God dang. All right, we got to score right here though because they they not a pussy team. Hey, Roy. Okay, out oh, damn. Boy, stay in the middle. Wow. Good. No three. Release him, Roy. Oh, don't hold that. Roy, you, you be, I don't like how you play that. I don't like how you play pick and rolls. Because you allowing these guys to shoot. You, you can't sit in there. Don't sit. It's a big possession. Big possession. If we can get a stop here, we win the game. That big must can shoot. Okay. Rebound. It, hold on. Good pass. Good teamwork. All right, we a four point lead, no threes. Give that big a chance to shoot. Shoot. So if this dude beat me off the angle, you you take my middle. I right, release him. Go, release him. Good. Now you take take my angle. Good. Now get now. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Sport. Sport. Rebound. That's green. Wow. Great rebound. That's green right there. Good rebound. Great. Great teamwork. All right, Roy, you release him. Good. We can live with it. We'll at least let's find out. All right, now we know. Sports, send me a pick. Roy, go through. Sports, slip. Good pass. I wanted to, but. Watch that angle. Good. Good D. Damn, I gave it. Ooh, I got lucky. Oh, good shit, Roy. That's a decent shot. Roy, Go. Big rebound. Good rebound. I'm going under. Good. I ain't gonna shoot it. Good shot. Good hit. I'm going under. That means you stay with your dude. Good, 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 good. Stop. We can live with it. That's a lockdown. 
That's a bad pass. Okay, it made it. Good stuff. Good stuff. Almost over. I want you to shoot that dude. That's you, Roy. All right, good game. Okay. Uh, all right, two points, two points. Patient. I don't know what the fuck. No threes. Good D. Stay up, Roddy. Good sport. Alright, damn. Sport. Good pass. Man. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> that is challenging. I don't know how that little man came up with the ball in that situation. Yo, I ain't gonna lie. Yo, I think the takeover is so fire, bro. Have you ever wondered what separates the 1% from everyone else? Obviously, there's something. And people always talk about the 1%. And it's, it's interesting to me because people say the rich as if rich people are just one person, right? The rich, right? And it's fascinating. Or there's, there's one category of rich people. Like there's one, or, or white people, or black people. Like there's only one avatar of black person. One avatar of white people. One avatar. Oh, men just. Women just. It's so fascinating. Um, I'll get into that in a minute. Because today I want to talk to you about the traits. Six traits that separate the 1% from everyone else. As I'm going through these six traits, why don't you do this? Why don't you get a pen and paper as I'm going through these six traits, and as you write them down, the ones that you have, put a check mark beside them. The ones that you, put a check mark beside them that you have them. Put the ones that you don't have, circle them and start working on them. See how your life changes. So, first of all, the secret psychology of the 1%. What is a secret? What is a secret? A secret is something that is not known or seen or not meant to be known or seen by others, by people other than the people you intend to know or see it. That's what a secret is. And so the secret psychology, there's a secret psychology? There's a secret psychology. What's psychology? The scientific study of the human mind and its functions, especially those affecting behavior in a, given con in a given context. So what does that mean? That means, that means it's a way of thinking, studying a way of thinking. If you wanna think about psychology, it's studying a way of thinking. So when I talk about the secret psychology of the 1%, I'm talking about uh, this, this way of thinking about things that a small group of people have and they don't want other people to see it and they don't want other people to know it. Well, I'm going to pull back the curtain because I heard somebody say 
when you learn what the magician knows, it isn't magic anymore. So let's talk about the top 10, 5, 1, 10, 5%, 0, 1% of income earners. Let's talk about earnings. Because if you're in the top 1% as an athlete, you're going to be one of the top, you're going to be in the top 1% of income earners. If you're in the top 1% of, of business owners, you're going to be in the top 1% of income earners. If you're in the top 1% of authors, you're going to be in the top 1% of income earners. So the top 1% is not just money, right? But it almost always includes money. So let's talk about how much money the top 0.1% make, the top 1%, the top 5%, the top 10% make. And I got this off of some tax website. I don't even remember the name of it now. Man, I, meant, I should have put that on here. Anyway, so the top 10% in America earn $167,639 a year. That's a fairly low number for it to only be 10%, right? Okay, right? I mean, if you think about it. I mean, it's not, it's not mega wealth. C- I mean, it's decent income for sure. I mean, you can make less than that as decent income, right? So $167,639, that's the top 10%. The top 5% earn $335,891. The top 1%, according to this tax website that I found this on, makes $819,324. And the top 0.1% makes, that's 1% of 1%, so that's 1 one-hundredth of 1%, make $3,312,693 a year. Now, I would have thought that all of those numbers would have been bigger before I looked this up. Wouldn't you have thought that? Like, I'd have thought, I'd have thought they'd been, like, people talk about those top 1%. You, when somebody says the 1%, you think they're talking about billionaires. No, these are people who make $3 million a year. They're not billionaires. Top, no, that's, that's not the top 1%. That's the top 1 one-hundredth of 1%. That's the top 1% of 1%. And the top 1% makes $819,000 a year. You'd think 1%, like the way they talk about the 1%, oh, they set it up, the 1%, they don't pay any taxes. Well, the 1% actually, anyway, that's another conversation for a different day. Pays more taxes than the... Uh, lower income because it's a percentage of your income. So anyway, so what are the things that separate the one percent from the other ninety-nine percent? The one percent have a particular perspective, and what is that particular perspective? Well, that one pr- that perspective of the one percent is the one percent stand up to stand out instead of falling in. Um, to fit in and be liked. They stand up to stand out instead of, um, they stand up to stand out instead of falling in line to, instead of falling in line to fit in and be liked. So the top 1% is more concerned with purpose than popularity. Now, sometimes your purpose will make you popular. Sometimes your purpose will make you unpopular. Like, if if you're going to have celebrators, you're going to have haters. Some people will never be in the top 1% because they can't stand it when there are people who don't like them. Am I telling the truth? Some people will never rise to the level of their potential because the pain of antagonists Haters and trolls is too great. Now, I read a book a couple of years ago called Anti-Fragile. I would recommend it to all of you. Two books like that will really help you develop this aspect of the 1%. One of them is called Anti-Fragile. And the whole premise of Anti-Fragile is this. The same wind that feeds a forest fire extinguishes, extinguishes a candle. So what's the moral of that story? Don't be the candle, be the forest fire. (laughs) That's the whole emphasis of anti-fragile, in a nutshell. 
But the book was great, and it's worth reading. The other book is The Coddling of the American Mind. I mean, in fact, I'm going to give you another one, too. The Coddling of the American Mind. I don't remember who wrote it. Um, I read it many years ago, but it just showed how our society, how our miseducational misdirectional system, how our so-called institutions of higher learning and our um, government indoctrination camps, a.k.a. public school systems, are designed to make people mentally weak. And by the time they become adults, they can't do anything. That's why you have now, if you have these people now who, if someone's attempting to have a conversation with them, they'll just throw a tantrum and start screaming so they don't have to listen to anything. I would be aware of people who are afraid of opposing opinions. So one of these days I need to do a whole video on how to win an argument every time. <laughs> It'll be a sh really short video. Here's, here's what you do. Be right and don't care about the consequences. <laughs> right? Um, and you may, not, you may not win the argument in everybody's mind, but you won. Why? Because there is no argument against the truth. Right? Anyway, one of the ways you can tell if somebody has a valid point is if they call the opposing voices a name to discredit them instead of addressing their argument. It's, in, in, in rhetoric, it's called an ad hominem fallacy. So an ad hominem fallacy is if Ed and I are having a conversation and Ed disagrees with me, and I want to discredit Ed because I know he's right, and I know I can't win, I just call him a racist, and now everybody will stop listening to him. I call, you, you can call him a sexist. You, you, you make up a term, or there already is one, and you call them the name, and the name that you called them now means that they're disqualified and their opinion holds no value. Add him in a, him in file. Like now, now you start looking for it when you're watching, when, you, and when you're watching anything, when you're having a conversation with somebody. If their only retort is to call someone a name, it's because they know their argument is weak. Or maybe their argument's just weak and they don't even know their argument's weak, and they're resorting to using an ad hominem fallacy even though they don't know that they're using it. Okay, anyway. So the top 1% doesn't care, though. Top 1%'s not going along to get along. The top 1% does not sign the banana and be one of the bunch. The top 1% stands on what they believe to be the truth regardless of consequences. They're not going along to get along. The top 1% doesn't just do what everybody else is doing because everybody else is doing it. And if you're one of those people who goes along to get along, signs banana to be one of the bunch, and you don't want anybody to be like disappointed with you, you want everybody to be happy with you, just resolve to know that there's no possible way with that mindset that you will ever be one of the 1%. It can't, it can't happen. Why? Because you have to have a... You have to have the ability to stand in the face of adversity if you are going to be one of the 1%. So, the second trait, that was trait number one. Do you have it? And you know if you have it, are you a people pleaser? See, what we don't realize is God put us here to please God and serve people, not to please people and serve God. Mm -hmm. So, so they have a particular perspective. They harness personal power. What does that mean? That means the 1% recognize the difference between contributing factors and determining factors. And the 1% do not attempt to control situations and circumstances, but focus instead on controlling themselves. I cannot control what happens to me. I can control what I'm gonna do next, what meaning I'm going to assign to the thing that happened to me, and what I'm going to focus on. Those are the things I can control. I have no control over whether or not somebody runs into the back of my car. I can't control them. But I can control what I do if someone runs into the back of my car. I can't control whether somebody says something bad about me. I can control what I'm going to do if somebody says something bad about me. I can't control negative trolling comments on Instagram and YouTube and X and all the rest of those platforms, but I can control what I'm going to do when somebody posts a negative comment. And I'm not going to go melt and sit on the floor in my bathroom and cry. Why? Because, it, like, because of the first point that I already gave you. I'm not seeking, I'm not looking for votes. I don't have to be politically correct. I would rather be right than politically correct. Anyway, so, so 
we focus on factors that we can control. And we don't focus on factors we can't control. We, we recognize that there's a difference between contributing factors and determining factors. Now, some of y'all ain't going to like this, but that's all right. You'll either grow to like it or you'll stay stuck like Chuck. It's your choice. So there are two types of factors in every circumstance. How many types? Two. Two, two types of factors in every circumstance. There are contributing factors and there are determining factors. You want to live a miserable life? Go through life believing that contributing factors are determining factors. You will be miserable your whole life because you can't control contributing factors, but you can control determining factors. Here's the, how you can tell the difference between a contributing factor and a determining factor. All contributing factors are outside of you. All determining factors are inside of you. What does that even mean, Myron? That means if somebody runs into the back of my car, that's a contributing factor. It contributed to the experience of my day. If I spend the rest of my day moping because somebody ran into the back of my car, then I chose to take a contributing factor and turn it into a determining factor because now I've internalized it. I was talking to the folks this morning um, who are here in studio before we got started, and I was telling them when I was walking over here to, from my office to the studio, I, was, I, was, I, I became aware of, I, of this thought that I had, and I thought to myself, how it looks to people when I walk. I had polio as an infant. How it looks to people when I walk feels very different to me than it looks to you. Because to me, it just feels like I'm walking, like it feels like to you when you're walking. It doesn't feel, my walking doesn't feel any different to me than your walking feels to you. But my walking looks different to you, and it looks different to me than it feels to me. Are y'all tracking? And then I th had this thought, I'm so glad I had polio as an infant. How weird is that thought? It's weird if you don't understand that Contributing factors happen to give us the opportunity to use our determining factors to conclude so we can come to an, a, a conclusion that's either empowering or disempowering. And see, disempowering, when I look at the contributing factors of my life and I start looking for who's to blame, I start pointing fingers and it's this person's fault and that person's fault. And so if, if the if, if every problem in my life is in my life because of something going on out there, then the only thing that can fix my problems is a fix that comes from out there. That's why there's so many people waiting for their ship to come in while the 1% are swimming out to get it. The difference is you, 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 you don't wait for circumstances to change. You just change the circumstances while other people wait. That's the difference. The difference is you, can, you, you accept the things you cannot change, but you change the things you can. And if you'll do that, man, it's game on. Like, all of us have equalizers built into us, like built in equalizers, so that we can level the playing field. Be why? Well, I'm going to get to that later on. I, I don't want to give it away ahead of time. So, this is a different kind of perspective. If you're a person who thinks that your life is bad because of the government, you're a citizen, your life is bad because of the government. You don't have any hope of being one of the 1%. If you're black and you think that your life is bad because of white people, you have no hope of being one of the 1%. If you are white and you think your life is bad because of black people, or minorities, or somebody who's not white, you have no hope of being one of the 1%. If you're a man, and you think your life is bad or difficult because of women, there's no hope for you to become one of the 1%. If you're, if, you are, if you're poor, and you think you believe you're poor because rich people are rich, and it's rich people's fault that you're poor, you have no hope of being one of the 1%. If you're a woman, and you think your life is bad because of men, you have no hope of being one of the 1%. You're, if you think your life is bad because your parents didn't treat you good, there's no hope of you becoming one of the 1%. The only way for you to become one of the 1% is for you to take personal responsibility for every outcome. You don't have to take personal responsibility for every input. 
But you have to take personal responsibility for every outcome. And until you do that, your chances of becoming one per- part of the 1% are slim to none, and Slim has just left the building. <laughs> okay. So, that's the first two. They have a particular perspective. They harness the, their personal power. They have a they have particular um, they have peculiar pers- they have a peculiar perspective rather. They have they harness their personal power. They have a part they have particular practices. The one percent focus on mindsets and methodologies that produce mastery instead of mediocrity. So let me say that again. So the the top one percent have a particular they have particular practices in our minds in our methodologies the top 1% focus on mindsets and methodologies that produce mastery mindsets and methodologies that produce mastery and those mindsets and methodologies that produce ma- mastery help us escape from mediocrity. What does mediocrity mean? Mediocrity comes from the, from the root word what? Medium. What's medium? In the middle. What's the middle? It's not good. It's not bad. It's just kind of there. It's not great. It's not terrible. It's just okay. It's not excellent. It's not terrible. It's just average. Most people never escape from average. Why? Because they don't, they don't focus on mindsets and methodologies that produce mastery. And so therefore, they're left to spend the rest of their lives in mediocrity. What is mastery? What is mastery? Like I said, m- mindsets, mindsets and methodologies that produce mastery. Oh, he's just being alliterated. No, he's not. Mastery is real. So, um, What is mastery? Mastery is the ability to execute effortlessly without the use of conscious resources. How do you you gain mastery in an arena? I'm gonna quote my daughter, Dee Dee, because she has some of the best quotes ever, and this is one of my favorites. Kinda wish I'd have thought of it, but I gotta give credit where credit is due. Um, You have to practice it purposefully until you can practice it passively. Let me say that one more time. You have to practice it purposefully until you can practice it passively. It's like, it's like learning how to play the guitar. You learn how to change chords, and it takes so much intention to change chords, or piano, or keyboard. It, it, it seems so, it, like when you're watching somebody do it, it seems impossible until you learn how to do it, and then you're like, why did I ever think this was hard? Do you realize every difficult, everything right now that you perceive as difficult in your life, you could literally develop a mindset that says, okay, I'm going to master this, and then have a methodology for mastery, and then just keep on doing that repeatedly over and over again until it becomes second nature. So one of the things I'm learning right now is I'm learning, I already know them, but I'm learning to, I don't have them mastered, is all the notes on the fretboard of the guitar. So if guitar has, depending on the guitar, one of my guitars, I'll just talk about one of my guitars. One of my guitars has six strings and 22 frets. So whatever six times 22 is, what is that, 132, right? I think that's 132. So six times 22 is 132. There are 132 different, there are 12 different notes. There are 12 different notes, but there are 132 different positions for those notes on the guitar. My objective is to master to be able to look at a note anywhere on the guitar and know exactly what note it is in less than a fraction of a second. If you don't do that, you can't master a guitar because chords are built from notes. And so once you know that like, um, for instance, um, C, E, and G make a, make a C chord, right? Because the first, third, and the fifth make a, make a C chord. Once you know that, then all I have to do is find a C, E, and G everywhere on the fretboard, and I can make Cs all, all up and down the neck. But all of that, it has to be built through a concept that I call mastery stacking. You want a methodology that will change your life? Mastery plus mastery stacking makes you one of, can make you one of the 1% in your arena. So what's mastery? So how do you develop mastery? So what you do, so we have this thing called um, um, the circle of fifths. So 
I take my E string, my low E string. I, I should have brought my guitar in here, but I didn't know I was going to do this. So I take my low E string, and I go C, F, B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat, F sharp, B, E, A, D, G. Then I do it again. C, F, B flat, E flat, A flat, <laughs> D flat, F sharp, B, E, A, D, G. And I do it again, and I do that. If I do that, like, you could literally, anybody could memorize or like know, it's, it's more than memorizing, could know intuitively every note on the fretboard. If, even if you've never played the guitar before, you practice the circle of fifths, let's say I'll give you six weeks, you could master every note on the fretboard. You could do it in six days. But let's say you did the, the low E string 100 times a day for one week. And then you did the A string 100 times a day for one week. And then you did the D string 100 times a day for a week. If you did all six strings 100 times a day for a week, at the end of six weeks, you'd have the entire fretboard mastered. So week one, that's mastery of the, a str of the E string. Week two would be mastery of the A string. Now I've stacked my mastery of the A string on top of my mastery of the E string. And what happens when you do mastery stacking, it's how, and it's how people learn to juggle. It's how people learn to do gymnastics. You, you, learn, you master one component at a time. And once you have that component mastered, then you go and you learn to master another component. And then you stack one component on top of another component, on top of another component, on top of another component, until you have the whole thing mastered. And then before you know it, the whole thing's effortless. So that's called mastery stacking. But what most people do, um, Josh, I need you to cool it off in here for me, two degrees at least, okay? So what most people do is most people stack a lack of clarity on top of a lack of clarity. This is where overwhelm comes from. The reason you feel overwhelmed is because you haven't mastered anything. And so what, you, what, you, what most people do, here's what the average person does. They'll learn a little bit about a lot of things, and then they'll attempt to con put a conglomerate of all these things they know a little bit about together, and it's like a house of cards, and by, when they put the last piece on top, the whole thing collapses. That's how most people learn. Yeah, but the 1% don't do that. The 1%, ma they, they do mastery of one component at a time, and then stack mastery on top of mastery, on top of mastery, on top of mastery. You find anybody who's great at anything, that's how they became great. Okay, segmentation to completion is another one of those things that I call that, but mastery stacking is a method of segmenting until completion, segmentation until completion. Okay, so they have, the 1% have particular practices. What are those particular practices? They focus on mindsets and methodologies that produce mastery and escape mediocrity. That was number three. Number four, the 1% have persevering, they have a persevering persistence. The things that cause 99% of the people to quit cause them to quicken. What's quicken mean? Quicken means to come alive. The thing that causes other people to feel like, oh no, this is so terrible. I can't believe it. I wish you would have never started this thing. Right? The thing that causes most people to do that, like said, so, causes the 1% to say, okay, it's time to get in gear now. Huh? When they, when they go and get tough, what do tough do? They get going. Let's go. Let's go. All right, it's on now. Right? Um, it's, it's, it's the thing that separates the 1%. A persevering, persevering, I mean, a persevering persistence. Like, we just, we will not allow anything to bend our will. We bend everything to our will. Are y'all picking up what I'm putting down on the YouTube, in the YouTube sphere out there? Are y'all tracking? Are y'all with me? So, the top 1% have a persevering perseverance, a persevering persistence. Like, they just don't quit. One of the things you'll notice, a lot of people who become millionaires, they'll say, oh yeah, man, I, 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 I was rich once and I lost everything. That's so common. And then they climb back up, why? Because they have a persevering persistence. Like, Person who won't be stopped can't be stopped. I'm so glad. Um, plumbing inspired by James Golden. I don't know who that is, but I love that name. That, that, that just gets me going every time. Because my dad was James Golden. He was a plumber. And so somebody has the, I, I can't, I, I, whoever you are, 
tell me your name so I can know who you are. Plumbing inspired by James Golden. Because my dad taught me something when I was in elementary school. James Golden taught me something when I was in elementary school. Here's what he said. We, he and I were working on a car. It was an old flood car. It had this exhaust manifold. It had this rusted on bolt. It wouldn't come off. My mom called us for lunch. We were going in the house. Like I, can, like I can literally, when I'm talking about this, I can see me and my dad walking across the yard, getting ready to go into the house. My mom calls us for lunch. And I said, Dad, the bolt don't come out. It's not coming out. He said, oh, it's coming out. It's coming out. He said, you want to know why it's coming out, boy? Uh, yes, sir. Because we got a brain that don't have a brain. I'm like, oh, okay. And so from that point on, I realized if I am working on something, that doesn't have a brain. It can't beat me. It can't beat me. Like there's nothing that can't think that can beat a person who can think if they're willing to what? Think. But most people don't think. What? They just think they think. <laughs> think about that. <laughs> so you got to, if you like, by the way, don't forget what I said at the beginning of this video. As you're going through, as you're going through these these six traits of the 1%, check the ones you have, circle the ones you don't have, the ones you don't have, start working on them. And then give yourself some time, you'll be in the 1%. Number four, the top 1% in every arena have positive positivity in the presence of problems. The one, top 1% 1 flip the script that the 99% focus on. <gasps> Did you get that? Let that land. The top 1% flip the script. What do I mean when I say flip the script? Turn it over. Because you have to understand that if it's true that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, for every positive there's negative, every negative there's a positive. If that's true, and it is, that means it's impossible for a situation to just be bad. That's, it's impossible for a situation to just be a problem. A problem has to also be an opportunity. Opportunity to do what? Fix the problem. But sometimes, see, the 99% are so focused on the problem that they let the problem overwhelm them because they believe it's a determining factor. But the 1% says, oh, this is just a contributing factor. Now I'm going to figure out how to fix the problem. And then the 1% fix the problem. And then they sell the solution to the problem they just fixed to the 99% who are focused on it. Amen. Ah. <laughs> I wish I had some help in here. It's, 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 it's so, it's so, and, 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 and what, like, it's so obvious. It's not obvious if you're in one of the, if you're not if you're one of the 99%, it's not obvious. Why? Because you're doing what everybody else is doing. You're thinking what everybody else is thinking. You're saying what everybody else is saying. You're doing what everybody, like you are just one of the many. And that's why, like you, you have to be able to flip the script. It's impossible for something to just be bad. It's impossible for a problem to just be a problem. If in order for a problem to be a problem, it also has to be potential. So, would you like me to prove it to you? Okay, here it is. Have you ever eaten a one-sided pancake or made a sandwich with a one-sided piece of bread? Have you ever flipped a one-sided coin? Hmm? Hmm? Have you ever written on a one-sided piece of paper? No. Why not? Why have you never done any of those things? Because it cannot exist. None of the, it's not that those things don't exist. Something not existing is one thing. But something not having the ability, the possibility to exist is something else altogether. You've never done those things because they cannot exist, which means your problem cannot exist as only a problem. You, only, you, you just haven't flipped the script. You're so focused on the problem side, you haven't taken the time, or maybe nobody's ever even told you, turn it over! There's something great on the other side! How many of y'all tracking? Wave at me, my peoples. Like, there's a positive in every negative. But the question is, are you willing to flip the script? Are you just going to focus on the side that makes the most noise? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
All right, I'm going to give you the last one. Because of all these other five things, the sixth thing is this. The top 1% produce the pinnacle of profits. This is why the top 1% make the most money. Why? Because the top 1% are paid in direct proportion to the price that they have paid to be one of the top 1%. Oh, my face just melted. The top 1% produce the pinnacle of profits because they've paid the price for, they're paid in proportion to the price that they paid because they are paid in proportion to the price that they paid. By the way, can I tell you a little secret? Even the 99% are paid in the proportion of the price they're paid, that they've paid. Mm. How many of you ever heard the phrase, you get what you pay for? That's not just talking about at the grocery store or at the mall. I think about, I think about King Solomon. God gave Solomon a blank check. Now, if you're going to get a blank check from somebody, it would pay. It'd be good if that person had some resources. Like, if somebody's going to give you a blank check, you want to know they can cover it. Well, if God gives you a blank check, he can cover it. And he came to Solomon and said, ask what I shall give you. What do you want? I'll give you anything you want. What? And Solomon had the wisdom to ask for wisdom. (laughs) But why did God come to Solomon and say, ask what I shall give you? The only person I found in scripture, maybe there's somebody else, Pastor Tommy, you're here, you can straighten me out on this. Okay, the only person I found in scripture that the Bible tells us offered a thousand burnt offerings is King Solomon. Now a thousand is like, it's like the aluf in, in Hebrew, that's like the top of the top. It's the creme de la creme. In the, in, the, in the military, it's the general. You're like the top of the top. The aluf is the best of the best, the most elite of the elite, the top of the top. So when the, word, the term a thousand is bigger than just a thousand in number. It means like, like everything. And a burnt offering is a picture of total sacrifice. So a picture, like the burnt offering is, I'm giving everything to God, I'm leaving nothing for myself. One of the reasons God gave Solomon what God gave Solomon is because of the price that Solomon paid. It wasn't the only reason, but it was one of the reasons. It was the price that he paid, a thousand burnt offerings. See, you're not willing to have one burnt offering for the things that you say you desire. We give lip service to desiring outcomes, but we're unwilling to pay the price. Like, I decided last year, um, as a result of one of the contributing factors was reading your book, Milton. I decided I need to learn to, I need to master the guitar. Because when I was reading your book, it helped me realize that music, the better I understand music, the better I understand life. And I could already play the guitar. So I decided I'm going to master the guitar. Why did I decide I'm going to master the guitar? Now, here's what, here's what that means. That means for the rest of my life, I am going to be studying music theory. <laughs> that's what, that's, that is what it meant. And practicing music theory for the rest of my life. And then regardless of how good I get, regardless of how good you get at music, and any musician who's listening to me right now, you know this is true. Regardless of how good you get at music, you can always get better. There's always something else to learn that you didn't know. There's so many, it's, there's so many layers of musicality in music theory. It's just, it's mind-blowing, but it's fascinating. It's, it's like life. Music is like life. Golf is also like life. But anyway, that's, I'm not going to go into golf right now. So, so when I think about all the amount of times, like I must have played Cycle of Fifths yesterday. I, must have, I, I didn't do it 100 times yesterday, but I know I did it 40, 50 times yesterday. Well, I was just sitting there. I just kept doing it over and over and over and over again. Why? Because if I don't master it, then I've decided that my excuses have already mastered me. And so many people have allowed their excuses to master them. They will never become one of the best of the best. And by the way, God created you to be the, one of the best of the best. Most people just won't. Now, here's the interesting thing about the last part. Um, 
the 1%, are paid in proportion to the price they paid. There's a law called Price's Law. You've heard me talk about it before. It's one of my favorite things to think about. And every time I'm tempted to be a slab and a slouch and not do the work, I think about Price's Law. So, here's Price's Law. Price's Law states, in fact, I'm going to do it on the board because I'm going to do it on the board so you can really wrap your mind around what I'm saying. So, because usually when you start talking about numbers, because we teach math backwards in America, people will disengage their mind. You start talking about numbers, they check out. This is one of the most important things I'm sa I've said all day. Y'all ready? So, so, so Price's Law states that 50% of the production of any domain, 50% of the production of any domain is produced by the square root of that domain. Okay, yeah, 50% 50, 50 of the production of any domain is produced by the square root of that domain. Now, what does that mean? That means that if you have four tomato plants or salespeople or businesses, four, then the square root of four is two, that means Two tomato plants produce half the tomatoes. It means two salespeople produce half the commissions. It means two businesses produce half of the gross domestic profit in that domain. Okay? Well, that makes sense because two is half of four. But here's what's crazy about Price's Law. The bigger the number gets, the less sense it seems to make. What does that mean? Well, if you take the number 10, for instance, I could do nine, but I'm just going to do 10. Um, oh, no, I can't do 10. I'm going to do nine. Nine. The square root of nine is three, which means 50% of the tomatoes, 50% of the tomatoes are produced by three tomato plants. Half of the tomatoes are produced by three. What does that mean? That means the other six plants produce the other half. These three plants are producing as much as these six plants. Well, if it's salespeople... That means half uh, produced, by, produced by, why do I keep writing half? Half is not right. I'm like, why, why do I keep writing half? It's not half, it's the square root. So, oh, that's a great way to do it. So, which means if I take, um, if I take um, nine, the square root of nine is three, half is produced by this, or ha half is produced by half, 50% of the production is produced by three people. The other six tomatoes, or the other six salespeople, have to split the other half of the commissions. If there are six businesses in a town, three of them produce half of the gross domestic product. The other six have to split the other half. Now watch what happens when you get to really big numbers. You get to 25. Five is the square root. That means five tomato plants produce half the tomatoes. The other 20 produce the other half. But what happens, it doesn't produce it proportionally either because then there's prices law on this number. And there's a prices law on the next number. And then there's prices law on the next number. Are y'all tracking what I'm saying? Okay, so the square root of 20 produces the other half in this domain. And then the square root of whatever that number is produces half in that domain. So it's, it's, it's kind of mind-blowing when you think that when it gets to 100, 100 tomato plants, half of the tomatoes are produced by 10 plants. The other half are produced by 90. You have 10 salespeople, 100 salespeople in an organization, 10 of them make half the commissions. The other 90 people have to split the other half. Well, when you get to the United States of America, this is, this is, this is kind of mind-blowing. Well, it's more than kind of mind-blowing. There are 30 million businesses in the United States of America. The square root of 30 million is 5,744. That means 5,744 businesses out of 30 million are producing half of the gross domestic product of the United States of America. And the other 29 million, 400 and, no, 29 million, 266, I think is the right number, is, no, 29, whatever it is, 29 million, nine, yeah, whatever it is, the rest of them. Somebody else do the math. I, I'm, I'm, I've already done too much math in my head. 
have to split the other half. It's, it's, what does that mean? That means if you take the average revenue of the top businesses, the top 1% of business, the, well, the top um, businesses in the United States, 5,744 of them produce half of the gross domestic product. But man, that's not fair. Well, get used to it, baby. It's called life. And as my dad told me when I was in elementary school, life ain't fair. So Myron, what are you saying? I'm saying now instead of just envying the 1%, instead of just hating the 1%, instead of just being angry with the 1%, instead of thinking the 1% is the reason why you don't have enough of whatever you think you don't have enough of, just make a decision that you're going to apply these six traits to your life. You're going to stop being one of the average and ordinary, and you are going to have a particular perspective that you're going to be willing to stand out instead of falling in line to fit in and be liked. That you're going to harness a per personal power and you're going to recognize the difference between contributing factors and determining factors and you're going to take personal responsibility for the outcomes in your life. And you're going to have, a particular, you're going to have particular practices. You're going to focus on mindsets and methodologies that produce mastery and help you escape mediocrity. And then you're going to have persevering persistence and you're, the things that cause other people to quit are going to quicken you. And then you're going to have positive pers positivity and persistence and flip the script so that the other thing that everybody else is focusing on, you flip it over and you focus on the opposite side and you're the one that gets the benefit of it. And then lastly, you're going to, you're going to um, produce the pinnacle of profits because you realize you're going to be paid in di direct proportion to the price that you've paid. So you're going to be willing to pay the price for every outcome you desire in your life for the rest of your life. And this is the secret psychology of the 1%. Now the question you've got to answer for yourself, are you going to make it your secret psychology or are you just going to let everybody else use it? All right. Hope, hope you enjoyed this video. Stay blessed by the best. We'll see you in the next video. Bye for now. I don't think it's no help for me. I don't play too many games. This is it. We didn't shoot it. That's two points. Where are you, Paint? Shot. The teamwork. That's on me. That's me. That's me. Switch, Roy. Good, good. Good box out. Good game, fellas. That's green. Mm. 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 So, testing out that um, driving to you. And then not jumping. Yeah. The IQ players don't, don't fuck with you. Like people like Roy, Pump Fake. But if you don't do nothing, it's going to be a bounce off. So more time than none, your player not going to react to nothing. And you're going to be like, damn, I should have jumped. And it's just going to be a free two point. So it's hard to judge it. But you probably just want to be in the right position so that don't you don't have to be faced with that challenge. Because if you got to make a decision, the decision is going to be you should have jumped.